Welcome to the Brains Magazine podcast, a podcast with in-depth interviews and conversations with world-class entrepreneurs, expert coaches, industry leaders, and international celebrities. Get exclusive insight into the world of business, mindset, leadership, and lifestyle with your host, Mark Sefton. Welcome to this episode of the Brains Magazine podcast. And today we have our first competition winner, which is super exciting. We have Gogo Danio Lanzi and founder of the Gogo Danio Lanzi uh, Institute of Spiritual Healing. Well, first of all, congratulations, Gogo. How are you today? Yeah, I'm excited. Fantastic. Nice to feel, feel, you know, when you said our winner, I was like, what? I won. It's very exciting. It is very exciting. It's always good to do something different. It was actually my suggestion, so I I can take the honour on that one. I I was suggesting that we create something uh, for the community uh, to be able to to benefit so that we can co-create something beautiful over the next 30 minutes or so. And, yeah, just congratulations uh, once again, uh, Gogo. Uh, on Thank being you. our first competition winner. Yes, excellent stuff. So I want to kind of dive straight in with you today. Um, what, is the, what is the Institute of Spiritual Healing? What is that? So the Institute of Spiritual Healing grew from a, you know, private practice, a Sangoma practice. So maybe I need to start by what, what is a Sangoma mm. because it will then give us the context of what the Institute of Spiritual Healing does. Um, and actually we are changing the name from because I'm separating my brands. So there's Coco Dineo, the brand um, that applied for the competition. And then there's the Nlanzi Institute of Spiritual Healing, which it's an, it's kind of like a, a school, you know, where we train other healers to become healers like us. And that school is run by me and my husband. Um, and he's got his other work because he's a musician um, and he's in the process of recording also different kind of music. So it's kind of like new age African music, African spiritual music that really get get people really connecting to divinity. So uh, I'm a Sangoma, so I'm I'm, I'm many things, but um, why I really applied was because of being a Sangoma. And a Sangoma is, is one who is gifted with the gift of seeing, hearing and feeling. Um, I know the West would say it's shamanism or it's an impact. But with us, it's not like you can have an interest. So you can listen to my story and you'd be like, oh, I would like to be a Sangoma. I want to come and train at the Institute of Spiritual Healing. No, it is a gift. So it it gets passed on from one ancestral generation to another and you are born with it. So you don't don't just develop a skill. It's in it with you. And then when you go for training, that's when we kind of polish the skills and we help you align with the gift itself because working with spirituality is so complex and we are not really um, a society that nurtures our nature, which is spiritual. For me, spirituality is about our nature. We're not a society that nurtures our nature. We nurture the intellect and other aspects of our lives. So when you come to the Institute of Spiritual Healing, we nurture that, we return you back to your divinity and help you work with the gift that you've been given with because a lot of people fall sick, like physically ill, because they're not taking the gifts, things do fall apart in their life because, you know, they're not one with themselves and they're not in alignment with with, with their divinity. So that's what the Institute of of Spiritual Healing does. And I normally say to people, Isangoma, which is, it's singular, and then Isangoma is plural, so more than one. Isangoma is one who's the intermediary between the living and the spirit world. Okay. I think it's good that you set that context because, when I was doing a bit of research, I thought that it was actually a small town within South Africa and a name associated with a citizen of, of that particular area. <laughs> That's what I found. So I'm glad that you kind of shared that and gave us some context. It's interesting, isn't it, that I think, you know, we're seeing more manifestations in the physical body due to emotional sickness or maybe indeed spiritual misdirection as well. Uh, how that how that plays out it, it does seem to be something that we we need to be mindful of you know definitely you know I think you also seeing in terms of what's happening in business 
they are prioritizing emotional and mental well-being. Um, so we used to be only, um, you know, credited or you needed to bring your intellect to work, but we understand that humans are complex. So they comprise of body, mind, spirit, emotions. And if you're not tendering to all the aspects of a human, so you cannot have a, a high performing employee. So you could see with the emergence of, you know, executive coaches, life coaches and so forth, as it is, it, it's also a requirement that people's wellness plays a critical role. So spirituality is part of wellness. Mm. I mean, when, when we, we look, when we diagnose, because we don't only diagnose the psychological or the emotional or the spiritual, even physical, we deeply look at what is not at ease with the body. So disease is what is not at ease. And we try and look for the root cause. So not just you experiencing a migraine because you've got a, you know, it's just a headache because you are stressed, but how come? And we keep on digging deeper because once we can heal things at that level, then we are not becoming a disease creating nation because you understand that with allopathic um, healing or allopathic medicine, it heals symptoms. African spiritual healing looks to heal the root cause of disease. Interesting. Very interesting. I know we're going to dive in a little deeper on some of that. In 2019, you took stage on the TEDx Cape Town and, I, and shared four key lessons you learned as a spiritual healer. I'd love to know what those lessons were, Gogo. First, the biggest lesson is I give, I take my head off for everyone who does a TEDx talk. If you have done it, it takes a lot of work. It's it's so rigid. I didn't know because, you know, it's about sharing ideas, innovative ideas. You think, oh, I just go there because I normally, when I speak, I get my notes, but I speak from the heart. But with TED, my biggest lesson was really, I mean, one was time management, but also being organized because you needed to put your, your thoughts or your heart ideas into paper. So it was really hard. And I did it in the middle of my training because I went to go do another training as a Sangoma in rural Mozambique, where I needed to drive two hours to connect with my coach. So it was really challenging to a point where I felt maybe I'm just taking on too much. Maybe I can't do my training and come back to South Africa to do the TEDx talk. But it was, you know, I said, let me trust what is the discomfort. And I think the discomfort was doing something outside my comfort zone. And I said, you know, when I be when I went for my Sangoma training, I made a promise to myself that if I complete it, because that training is militant, Mark, it's like you are in the military school on steroids. So it's intense. Um, and I said, if I can complete this training, nothing in my life is, is going to be impossible. And I've lived by that principle of really seeing what I am capable of. So when I did the TED talk, I had 10, 10 spiritual ideas I wanted to share, but you have 15 minutes on stage. So the four lessons that I shared was um, when things fall apart, they actually fall into place. And um, I think that I don't remember all of them, but I'll, I'll, another one was healing is a journey. Um, so it's not a quick fix. And um, we need to also understand that the people we are trying to heal needs to sign up for the healing itself, irrespective. And that's why development has not worked so much in Africa is because we come, we observe, and we, we see a need and we want to impose our ways versus people saying, this is what we would like. So similar to spiritual healing as well. And the other thing is also, um, I think, I'm not sure of the two other lessons. I've done that in 2019, but it's on YouTube. So people can, can, can go and look and look and look at it. Um, yeah, but there were 10 initially that I wanted to share, but I needed to stick to the four and go deeper into the four. I think the other one was, um, in, 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 the, in the age of where popularism is, 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 is trending, how does one become authentic, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. And I think the other one, I, I spoke about the importance of rituals. Mm. They're not as I'm, I'm saying them, but it was something along those lines. I know that when things fall apart, they fall into place was my first lesson that I shared. Yeah, it's a good one. <laughs> Plus it encourages people to go after this, after they've listened to this interview, then go to YouTube and and, and check that out uh, for sure. It's interesting that you talked about TEDx uh, or TED Talks being rigid. I must admit, um, I almost think there's a there's a marketing opportunity for for someone to create something outside of TED because I I, I was framing a TED Talk, but in, in interestingly. 
the fact that it's actually not about conforming my talk didn't fit within the the ted kind of rigidness i, I really didn't enjoy that rigidness of where they wanted my talk to go when actually the essence of my talk was all about not being confined not being you know put into a mold you know so in some ways while i love ted it also didn't fit for me and i'm sure there's probably other people out there and i think there's probably it probably is a marketing opportunity for someone uh, to do something so did you do it did you Sorry? end up doing the talk did you no end up i doing didn't the talk? no it just didn't fit you know and sometimes sometimes in life we can either try and flex uh, and adapt and then other times we just have to accept that it's a great opportunity but it's not the not the right time or or even for me and sometimes i think in life we have to hold on to our own uh, nerve and integrity too rather than just yeah. trying to fit in you know as much as i love the brand yet yeah, it's not been something that i've been able to do because of the rigidness of it but yeah it's uh it's interesting you know to hear those lessons i love that when you said when things fall apart you know things fall into place that takes the pressure off us having to get it right all the time, which I think is is so important. Now, one of the things that you do, Gogo, is that you're a facilitator of change. How do we become facilitators of change, do you think? I think we become facilitators. It starts with self, you know. So before I became a Gogo, and just to let people know, because when you Google Gogo, there's a lot of Gogos that come out now because um, I'm one of the first people to really want that that name Gogo to be a, a professional title. So in South Africa, Gogos are known to be the uh, elders in the community. So by chronological age, but because we carry, we kind of like um, encyclopedias of the spirit world and we are transmuters of messages. So when we, I was training, we were called Gogos all the time and Gulus, elder, elder. So I wanted to be called a gogo instead of what we used to be called because it was the term that was used during apartheid was witch doctor, which had a you know a stigma and a demonization around it. And then post apartheid, then everybody wanted to be called traditional doctor. But I didn't want to be called traditional doctor because what I did was more than doctor. I I carried you know more than just intellect but wisdom as well. So I went for the name Gogo and then everybody took it on. So that name was never used before. Then when I went to mainstream radio and, and, and t television, I was intentional about how I was going to be called Gogo because I come to this interview not on my own, but with an interaction of wise elders uh, that have used my, you know, my voice as a vessel to, try, to, 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 to get their messages across. So, um, yeah, so I wanted to, to set that tone as well. It feels like, who knows? I feel like we're going to have a series of these conversations because there's a lot of teachings that is that is required. Um, please repeat your other question. I think I missed it as I was trying to explain about Gogo. Now, that's OK. I was just asking you, how do we become oh, facilitators, facilitators of change? Yes, you said change. it starts with us. So, it starts with us. So I, I, I have been a facilitator since the year 2000 um, and I still do some facilitation work. So, and a, a lot of majority of my work was working in social complex systems. So education and uh, health, um, you know, climate change, and it's bringing leaders from different sectors to come together and collaborate. But what I've realized that people fail to work with people who are different from them because they've not really worked on themselves. Because a lot of times when you come on those high stake issues, when you look at COVID, for example, I mean, this is such a debatable issue about do we do this, don't we do this, what is working, what is not working. But when you're looking deeply, people are actually trying to, un to iron out their own agendas by bringing COVID into this. And that's very typical of complex social issues where people are not willing to step away, right, and see things from a higher perspective and say, let me listen to you. Because for me, when we're in dialogue, it's like, I don't have to agree but I have to appreciate your input and your perspective because it might actually enrich mine or it might help mine you know, look differently from how you are contributing. So when you're a facilitator of change, holding space, because a facilitator is one that holds space and helps people navigate around complexity. You cannot do that if you are conflicted. You know, as, as, and that's why even I am a spiritual healer trained as a Sangoma and other modalities as well, because I believe that learning is important when you are healing, 
because humans change and evolve all the time. So what I know 10 years ago when I did my training and what is happening now might be slightly different. So for me, when you are a facilitator of change, work with self, you know, work with self is, is paramount to how you show up, not only as, as a facilitator, but in any work form, because to show up 100%, you need to be able to have shown up for yourself 100% because we, we we cannot give our best if we are not within our best, you know? Mm, mm. Um, I, I think when I was in your in your clubhouse yesterday, somebody spoke about authentic, you know, that they had to learn from feedback given to be authentic and trustworthy. trustworthy. And I think we struggle to be authentic because we don't really know who we are because we're not invested in ourselves. We invested in other things and other people and how other things are done. So to be a change agent, you need to know how you, you need to have changed self best. The ability to work with yourself and see yourself transform and change gives you the tools to do the same within the workspace that you will be working in. Yeah. So in essence, change your world uh, and then change the world. So it's like the byproduct of your own I guess unraveling uh, and discovery of self then helps you then discover uh, and help identify other people's ability to change too. But it, it, it comes from your own personal journey first. Yeah, love that. I would love to know, in your opinion, Gogo, how, how are we hurting ourselves? How are, we, how, are we, how are we hurting our spirits the most? What are we doing that views the most damaging? I mean, we know that um, the World Health Organization names dep uh, depression as one of the most deadly diseases in the world. And we don't speak about mental or psychological well-being because it's not evidence than your you know, physical elements. So when somebody has a cough, it's in our face because we all experience it. But when somebody is depressed or is struggling with mental illness, it's not obvious because it's their own inner battle. And I think for me, we, we hurt ourselves when we're in denial of our true selves, when we deny our own lived experiences. So when I came and became an African spiritual teacher, it comes from teaching from my own experiences, my own truth. And it does not have to be everybody's truth. You don't all have to agree. But when I can be able to validate those experiences for myself and say, I have been through this and this is how I have had or this is how it has wounded me, and this is the kind of healing I need, then we stop self-hating ourselves um, because we all come from some sort of trauma. I love, um, I'm sure you know Dr. Uh, Mate, Gabor Mate, who speaks a lot on addiction and trauma. And I listen to a lot of, of his work as a spiritual healer because sometimes I struggle. You know, I can know this process works with the person, but I, I struggle. So I'm really, I mean, my work right now is being invested in, in understanding people, trauma and how childhood trauma plays a, a role in, in, in people not really healing because we, when, 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 we, we, when we're looking at healing interventions, no matter how great, but something blocks because psychologically and emotionally people have created a blockage. Mm -hmm. They're not even conscious about it because that's what trauma does. You know, Dr. Mate says that um, it is not what you've experienced that is traumatic and it's not to nullify the trauma. So I've experienced sexual abuse as a child. So that on its own is painful, but the deepest pain is not being able to share that experience. And I got that. So when we deny people speaking and owning about their experiences, we actually, you know, we are self-inflicting pain. And it's not just only speaking, because a lot of us can say me too. You know, we've had the me too campaigns or this is happening, but it's not also, it's the beginning. It's not the end of the healing journey. I, I found that for myself, that healing is hard work to revisit those experiences. It's very painful and it, it takes a lot of courage and it requires one to be vulnerable. So it, 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 it's, it's very painful, hard work, but it's worth it. So I've been on the journey of revisiting some of my experiences because when the sexual abuse happened, it was in the family. So I was like, no, man, I didn't scream. And I still care for this person. And that's what, you know, abuse of a loved one is because it does not stop you from loving them. Just because somebody has hurt you doesn't mean your natural love for them ends. And I think that's what I was looking for to validate that I was violated. 
So I needed to rewire because my brain is wired for trauma. I mean, growing up in South Africa, for those who know, as is right now, South Africa is one of the most unequal countries. It's quite violent. So it is a traumatic experience. But then our brain gets rewired for, you know, for protection, not for connection. So I need to rewire my brain so that I can stop hurting myself and allowing experiences that hurt myself. Because if we don't heal those things, that's why we find ourselves in abusive and painful situations, not because somebody else has power over us, but because we've rewired ourselves. So we, in our attempt to seek for protection, we are actually falling in the same traps of that which has wounded us. Mm, that was a great answer you're nodding a lot i sound like i'm 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 preaching to you <laughs> <laughs> no that was a great that was a great answer because you know i think we hurt ourselves a lot whether it's our narrative what we speak what we bury what we attach to shame and i love the fact that you've said actually the thing that harms us the most is actually when we we're not voicing that which we've experienced and and really creating space for people to be able to engage in some of that is is the start of the process of actually uh, healing and moving forward. So I'm glad that we we captured that one uh, in particular. Yeah. So Gogo, uh, I love some of your tweets, and one one of the tweets that kind of took my attention was something that you wrote, which said, "Sadness is an invitation to be still and listen to wisdom within, an invitation to let go of what no longer serves you." I, it really uh, stood out for me that that tweet, especially when we've we've talked about actually some of the ways that we hurt our own spirits is by not actually acknowledging some of the wounds that we have. How how do you formalize your your thoughts into words? I I always love when people like yourself do a lot of work teaching, uh, but how how do you go about formalizing those those thoughts and putting them into words? So I needed to close my eyes to hear that tweet very well. Um, and I think for me, my thoughts get formalized through my own feelings of things. So when I'm going through experiences or moments as I journal and I write things down, then the words come. Um, and I've got stacks of journals. It's one of my rituals actually to journal all the time. So that's how the words get crafted. But I think um, I'm a gifted, what is it, poet or writer? Uh, so words sometimes in the midst of writing just find themselves um yeah so that's that's how the words come um I think I said before we got cut off is that um I wrote a lot of poetry uh, growing up and it was my way of acknowledging my own experiences and that has been something since high school so it's been years of writing things down and writing things down so I'm actually looking forward to writing a book one day oh yeah i i've i've just wrote my third book and something that you touched on which i think is really key is in order to generate ideas you you have to pour ideas in it's like for me the best way for me to write is to increase my reading so it's interesting that we we you know you talk about journaling or consuming other books and and other ideas we then process them and then we we personal personalize that which is within and then it really connects with with the audience so glad that you mentioned uh, that one we i asked you already like you know what's the one way that we're hurting our, our spirits but well what's the what's the best thing we can do uh, for our spirit as well we need to nurture it you know the more we nurture it we can return to its true nature i think for me you know spirit, spiritual connections and i spoke as Journaling is one of my way of returning to my true nature. Um, one of the things that we, 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 we speak about in South Africa or in the context of African healing is Ugupasha. So it's an act, it's a ritual act of communicating and connecting uh, with, you know, with whether that's ancestral spirit or that's guides, but to understand that we in spirit are not alone. You know, we've got other spiritual entities that are with us, even though we might not see it. So doing those ritual acts are quite important in taking care of our spirits. Um, And and how do people know what their spirit likes or what connects to them? That's why I spoke about doing the work to go back to your innocence as a child, because in that innocence, as children, that's when we were mostly spiritual. 
because as children, you could see how divine we are. We love everything. That's why we suck on everything, including our toes and eat our hair, you know. And then once we get programmed and conditioned by the adults in our lives, we lose that divinity. And when we can do the work to go back uh, into what is my divine self and something is like, you know, the things that are made for some people is dancing. It's art, you know, for mm-hmm. some people is is yoga. Uh, for some people is really cooking a nice meal, taking a walk in the garden. Those rituals are really food for the soul. Mm. Yeah, it's it's so important, I think, that we know more now than ever what, what we need to do to nurture our mind, nurture our heart, nurture our spirit, and, and just be really uh, a great steward of those things because it's quite clear that, in life especially leadership it, it starts from within and then it is expressed out of that now you obviously have mentioned that you're a teacher what what do you see as the biggest challenge of being a teacher whether it's in the work that you do or whether it's in a classroom or whether it's in a company you know what's the biggest challenge you know for you being a teacher as you find i think you know teaching is a it's a type of leadership and I think the challenges in leadership in general, because we are called into leadership, uh, not to just be ordained with crowns and thrones, you know, but we are also called to bring the best in others. And I think the biggest challenge is um, being so invested in others that they, you know, when others are not ready to be taken where their aspirations are, you feel you failed. I think taking personal offense to failures is the biggest challenge. I mean, for me as a teacher, because I'm currently training 26 initiates, it's it's the biggest number of students I had to train. And when one, I had to actually um, expel one from the school because of a, you know, um, misconduct uh, and you take it on yourself. So understanding that the challenge is that do not see other people's failures as yours. The second one is that you know, live by example, I think it's, it's good to teach something, but I feel like as leaders, that which we believe in, we need to walk, you know, we need to definitely do that. So you cannot be speaking about diversity, but in, in how you engage and interact, you're always looking for a narrative that, that suits yours. So when we practice what we teach becomes, you know, it's a challenge because we can teach something, but we don't necessarily believe. I know there's certain things that I get challenged at around African spirituality because I feel like they, you know, they perpetuate marginalization of the other. And I have to sit with myself and like, how do I support this narrative? Even as a teacher who training to become a Sangoma, it's military. I have to be like, is this necessary? I understand that we need to do it this way, but is it necessary? And that's the biggest challenge to continuously review and 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 say no to things and say yes to newness and innovation for the betterment of the collective because i think one who leads is for you know for the collective it's not just to self-serve but move stepping outside that um uh, that uh you know out of your ego and into into self-serving and to serving others as well yes yeah i think when you're in that place of influence you know uh how you live and conduct yourself and how, how you treat others, you know, you can't, you can't hide that. We've talked about authenticity and, and the importance of knowing self, you know, and I think as a teacher, you've got great responsibility, but your, your lifestyle and the way that you carry yourself has to be congruent and in, and it aligned with, with what you're, what you're saying. So I think that's a, a really good um, share. But can I add one, yeah. one quick one? I think also be gentle with yourself because you are human. So I feel like as teachers, we can be hard um, because we don't also want to live and experience life. So be okay with your failures and mistakes because you're going to make mistakes along the way. And it's just about taking accountability, but you can't take responsibility for how other people have experienced you during your own turbulences, you know, but you can take accountability to say, I messed up here and this was not right and this is wrong but then you are not responsible for everyone and how, because people at the end of the day choose how they want to receive you as a teacher and they choose to believe in things because I think we, we are a society that is still seeking the Messiah. You know, When we speak about 
you know, my background is Christianity. So I speak a lot about Christ consciousness. The Christ consciousness was the, the power and the divinity within. It was not seeking God outside of ourselves. So when, when people are in dire circumstances such as poverty, they're always looking for a savior and a messiah. And, and, and they would blame the savior and the Messiah if the Messiah decides to be themselves sometimes because it's like, no, but how come you're doing this? Because you are the one who's supposed to take us out of um, you know, Egypt and you are the one who's supposed to liberate us. So I just think teachers also need to be gentle on themselves and understand that in the, our mistakes can offer the greatest lessons. So mm. don't be afraid to, you, it's not about perfection. Mm. That's, you know. yeah that's important because I, we're always our most harshest critic we always give ourselves the hardest of times uh rather than you know i've got a friend of mine called uh, lydia and she always says hustle gently and i love that idea of you know you do need to be tenacious but you need to do yeah. it with with compassion you know uh, and mindfulness of self um yes yeah, so so important I would love to know, Gogo, as we start to bring this into land, what's a one memory that you have had that you feel has had the biggest impact on your life? The memory of my grandfather, my late grandfather. So in the midst of the chaoticness, the violence, um, and the struggles of Alexandra Township, I was playing outside with my friends, and I was so hungry. And we had, we, I mean, we... We, we, we lived with less and I got home and there was one slice of bread left and he made me water. We call it scambele, it's water with sugar. And he took like and cleaned out a tub of peanut butter and made me a sandwich. But it is in the act of, it was an act of love for me because he could have easily said, you see, there's nothing, where's your mother? But how he did it really has left a beautiful memory because even when I, try and go with the stereotype of African cultures patriarchal. When I see how that man was a natural because he cooked for us, he bathed us. So he, he defied the stereotype of the African men. Um, it's what has had me on the quest of challenging certain ideas and ideologies that are seen or as African culture. And I would say our way of life can never be about just individuals. You know, our way of life is never about preserving one person but it's about the collective and that memory of my grandfather still yeah I mean as I speak I get emotional mm. but yeah he was my first love because I was raised by him mm. so yeah yeah but he taught me a lot about African men uh, than what I grew up to see I mean what I grew up to see were violent African men but they grew up in a violent South Africa so it was just the only way of life so I when I challenge uh, people in conversations about what is African culture and what is not. Um, you know, my grandfather's experiences are one of my living memories and evidence of that. We were not meant to be brutal to each other. We were not meant to hate on each other. We were really meant to be, you know, to take care of each other. Hence, we say, umundu, umundu ngabantu. <laughs> Do you know that, 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 that line? You don't know it. No, I don't know it. The spirit of Ubuntu. It's what Africans are known for. I am because you are. It's beautiful. I mean, the thing I love about when people share stuff uh, related to their families definitely resonates like with me. And it's interesting when people speak about grandparents, but I think, you know, me hearing your, your story, you know, it's clear that our challenge as human beings is to give out of what we have, you know, and, and the beauty of what you share with your grandfather is that he, he gave you what he had. You know, and sometimes it's not about how much you give, but it's really about what you give in relation to to what you have. Um, and I think that's the thing that's most beautiful is the fact that. And it's how you give it. Yes. I think for me, you know, because you can have you can have enough to share, but you can be sharing out of a space of oh no, right? But I think for me, it's when I got home and how he set me on a chair, or you know, set me on the chip headed with such diligence, but so much love. It is still one of the best things I've ever, my best favorite meal. So yeah, it's how we give what we have. Mm. Um, and when we give it out of love, we are then of service to others. Yeah. And food always tastes better, doesn't it? When you've got great company. 
<laughs> it always does. So, Gogo, before uh, we end today's episode, is there anything else that you wanted to share that you've got burning within? Uh, and let people know how they can interact with you and find out more about the work that you do. Okay, so on social media, I am Coco Dinell on Lanzi, but please, as you know, uh, with somebody who's well known, there's a lot of fake accounts, so people need to be wary. I don't engage people about personal issues on DMs. So when the minute somebody tells you you're gonna lose your life, it's not me. Um, the most reliable source of social media is Instagram because the following is evident and 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 I can I'm I'm quite active there. But there's also a website, cocodinoandanzi.com, and we I'm relaunching my brand on Sunday. So by the time people are gonna go there, they're gonna find a whole lot of other stuff than what is currently available. Um, but one thing I wanna share is that um, we are each other's teachers and healers. So I am to you as much as you are to me. So when we go back to self and, and offer ourselves kindness and love, we know how to offer it to other people. And we cannot get to a true sense of our divinity as humanity if we are not willing to deal with some uncomfortable truths about our past historical injustices. And I think that's one thing I've been wanting to share that sometimes it makes us uncomfortable because it's a call for change. We cannot pretend our histories don't exist and our past never hurt each other. But to truly experience human love and hu human connection, we need to be able to address some of those historical injustices. And I hope one day we can sit around the table and have our differences, but still show compassion, love, and be connected. Mm. Well, thank you for this rich, uh, deep dive into the work that you do and, and bringing a different essence to the Brains Magazine podcast. We really enjoyed having you and, and congratulations once again. Thank you. And I thank you for trusting me and, and, and bringing something different. And I hope that it's going to add value um, to the audience. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for joining this episode with me, Mark Sefton. I hope you've really enjoyed it. Feel free to leave us a positive review on iTunes. And I look forward to welcoming you back to the next episode of the Brains Magazine podcast. <laughs>